Welcome to this special edition of Useful Design Ideas. Using live steam injectors with stationary engine plants is problematic, owing to the water overflow when in use. This is a special tank design that I came up with. I'm making this episode for my friend Andrew, who's asked me about it many times. I originally created this special tank for a series that I made called Building a Stuart 504 Boiler Plant. And quite a while after that, I also included it in one of the top tip time videos. This is the complete creation of the tank from start to finish, and it begins with edited extracts from several episodes starting with part 4, making the special water tank for the live steam injector. I've been up to Blackgate's engineering and bought some brass sheet and some copper tubing. I already had the top copper tube, but I needed to buy a shorter piece of copper tubing that was a larger diameter than the top part, and once this piece of copper tubing is soldered to the base, this will form the overflow tank to catch the overflow from the injector. And after I've fitted a drain pipe to this bottom tank, I'll be able to pipe the drain to a bucket on the floor. So as the injector's working, there will not be water all over the bench. Both the base and this second piece of brass sheet are three millimeters thick, and this brass sheet is going to be cut to make the lid and the base of the tank itself. The tank needs to be elevated, so there's always water above the injector. In this clip, I'm marking the length that I need for the central column that supports the main water tank. I've made a mark on the brass bar using a felt tip pen, and now it's over to the metal cutting bandsaw to cut it to length. I'm going to machine the larger diameter piece of copper, which forms the tank that will catch the water from the injector, on the larger of my two lathes I have in the workshop. This one is fitted with a four-jaw self-centering chuck, and in this clip I'm turning the chuck by hand and using a deburning tool to remove the edge that the cutting tool's left. Now when I hold the parts in position, you should get the idea of what this is going to look like. But there's quite a long way to go yet. First of all, I need to make the base, I place the piece of copper tubing on the brass sheet, draw around that, and in this clip I'm using a square to mark out the finished size. In this clip I'm checking that the centre column is the correct length, by placing a ruler across the top of the tank and the column itself. And now it's time to machine the brass bar. I could have left the brass bar as it was, just plain, but I don't like to see bar stock on a model in its original unfinished state. It's not difficult to do some fancy machining on it, and the machining really isn't very fancy. But when it looks like this, it looks more industrial revolution. But leaving the bar in its plain unfinished state just makes it look very poor. With the semi-ornamental turning completed, I can try it in position. I've threaded one end only, and I'll show you why later on in the next video. And now when I put my steel ruler on the top of the column, you get the general idea of what it's going to look like. The next parts to make are the bases. I'll start off with the tank base. And so I know what this is, I'm writing the word base on it. I need to cut this piece of 3mm brass sheet to start with. So mark out the size, and once again it's over to the bandsaw. What I'm doing at the moment is drilling a hole in the middle of it, first of all with a centre drill, and then with a quarter of an inch diameter twist drill. You will notice that I'm holding this part in the vise on the drilling machine because it's much safer than holding it in my hands. And after the hole had been drilled in the centre, I used the bandsaw in the vertical position to allow me to get it approximately round. This brass part is going to fit inside this tube, but unlike the bottom tank, I didn't put this copper tube in the lathe to clean it up to the right size. Instead, I used my 4 inch belt sander. And it's surprisingly easy using a belt sander to get the edge perfectly square. All you do is sand it with the belt sander and then check it with a square like this. Squaring off copper tubing this way is surprisingly simple to do, but you do need to practice before you get it 100% correct. Now it's time to machine this piece of brass to fit inside the tube. And for this I'm using a quarter inch bolt, tightly fastened to the piece of brass, which will then go in the chuck but the chuck will hold the bolt by the nut, not by the threads. I'm not machining all the way down, I'm leaving a bit of a lip on this so that it locates on the brass tubing. And once the part is machined to the correct size, a quick touch with the file cleans it up, and it's a nice fit now in the copper tubing. Now it's into the outer part of the workshop, 
I'm spreading some flux around the joint and I'm about to solder the brass base in position. First of all, I need to get the piece of copper hot enough, not too hot as to cremate the solder, just hot enough for a good soft soldered joint. I'm also using resin cord electrical solder to solder this, which I find to be perfectly adequate. All I need to do now is to leave the part to cool naturally in the air. And the next part to make is the base. And why am I using a centre punch and not a centre drill? That's because I'm going to use a compass and I need somewhere to put the point. And first of all, I set it to two inches, which gives me the four inches diameter for the accurate positioning of the copper tank. And then by increasing the distance between the two points of the compass, I can describe an arc on the corners of the piece of metal. And by positioning a ruler across the corner points, not forgetting to allow for the thickness of the felt tip pen itself, I make a mark on each of the arcs. And these are the positions for the mounting holes. The next part of the job is to finish the copper tank. The soldering was successful and the part has cooled. It's now mounted in the three jaw chuck in the Boxford lathe and it's held in the chuck by the external part of the jaws and at the other end it's supported by a live centre. And by using a combination of filing and wet to dry sandpaper I get the finish that I require. Back now to the base. I've drilled the holes in the corners for the mounting bolts. Here's the support column, followed by the copper tubing that forms the drain tank. And finally, the main tank sits on top of the column. This is where the water tank is going to fit on the steam plant itself. The bottom part is going to be painted black to match everything else on the plant. And the upper tank is going to be left in polished copper. It seems a bit silly to have two water tanks in the same plant and it also seems a little bit pointless taking both of the water feeds from the top tank as the bottom tank is going to fill up with water from the injector overflow. I'm drilling a hole in the side of the bottom tank. Well it's not a bottom tank at the moment, it's currently just a ring of copper. But this will be soldered to a base, then it becomes a tank. On screen at the moment I'm showing me using a tap to thread the hole and as you can see I'm threading this by hand and this is a 5 16 by 32 threads per inch tap. And now with the aid of this socket, I'm fitting a steam union into the hole. And this steam union is the centre part of a double union. I use a lot of these, they're very useful things to have in the workshop. This clip shows the tank upside down with the outlet currently at the top. So that's the water outlet done, now it's time to do the water inlet to the pump, which is also an outlet if you know what I mean. In this clip, I'm actually using the water pump itself up against the tank, which is sat on its base, as it will be when it's finally finished, to find the position that I need to make a hole to take another union to feed the water pump. Before I soft solder all this together, I've put a couple of pipes in the fittings. I drilled out the fittings to accept these pipes, which are 3 sixteenths of an inch in diameter. Before I started to heat everything up to solder these parts together, I coated the edge of the copper pipe with some Friar Lux solder paint, I didn't really need to do this, this was a sort of automatic response. When I make close condensers, I always use Friar Lux paint. And that makes sure that once the Friar Lux paint melts, because I generally put a lot of it on if you've watched my other videos, it all runs down and forms a good joint. And then I just go around the outside edge with some of this solder. This is electrical type solder for soldering electrical connections. It has a flux built in, a resin flux that's in the centre cause. And I've always found this stuff to be perfectly adequate for soldering applications such as this. What I'm doing in this clip is using some flux and some water to spread out the solder and generally tidy up the job. I don't really need to do this, I'm just showing you what's possible when doing a soldering job like this. This is going to be the injector water valve. And this valve is going to be fitted into the polished copper part of the tank. And it's also going to support the weight of the injector, not that there's much weight to start with. So I'm measuring it up so I can make an adapter. Over now to my small box with lathe and I'm making the adapter. A very simple job. Face across the front and I'm just cleaning up the outside to thin it out a little bit. Obviously not too much because this is going to be threaded 5 sixteenths by 32 threads per inch to accept the injector as well as the outlet of the water valve. The next thing to do, as always, is to centre drill the end. And this keeps the twist drill that I'm about to use perfectly in line. There it goes. And finally, I'm using a 5 sixteenths by 32 threads per inch tap to thread the hole down the centre. The final job is to part off the finished component. 
Now it's time to fit it to the injector and the water valve. A little bit of Loctite 542 is always a good idea. I always use Loctite 542, it's a general purpose thread sealant. I use it on both high pressure and low pressure steam fittings. I'm using Loctite 542 in this application because I don't want any chance of an air leak in this junction. If there was an air leak here, the injector wouldn't work properly and it would keep spitting steam and water out of the overflow instead of it going into the boiler. Before I go any further, it's time to mount the central column. I countersunk the hole and this is a countersunk bolt. And the top part of the tank is secured to the column with an ordinary stainless steel bolt. Because this bottom tank can only be of a limited size, both from a visual point of view and a space available point of view, the original overflow needed to be modified. The brass overflow pipe simply screws into the injector body, so I removed it, machined it, and silver soldered a piece of copper piping into it. And this makes sure that the overflow of water goes into the tank, not on the bench. I've given the base a bit of a clean up, but it's difficult to clean because of all the small parts. But I have a solution. I will empty the dishwasher in the kitchen and when I fill it with the next load of crockery I will include my small water tank. This part has just come out of the dishwasher and it really is very clean. And I'm about to paint it but I don't want to paint the threads of the unions so I'm just putting some silicone rubber over these. It's quicker and easier than masking tape. And now that the part is painted I'm taking it back into the warmer part of the workshop. But now already it's the next day. I don't remember going to bed. And as it says on the tin to wait 24 hours before re-coating, I've waited 24 hours. I'm spraying the tank base now using some satin black. And this stuff sprays really well. I find this to be very good quality paint. And I've got this down to a fine art. I can put just enough paint on to do it in one go without the paint running and without it being too thick and going orange peely. But I think that's sometimes down to the quality of the paint. And as I said earlier, this is really good stuff. I don't want to give this another coat, so very carefully, after I've painted the outside, I'm painting the inside. And that's it, there's sufficient paint on the thing now. I don't need to go mad, because it would be really tragic if I put too much paint on and it ran down the side, but it's not going to do that. This clip on screen at the moment is running much faster than it should be, and that's why the brass blank looks more wobbly than it actually was. Either way though, it's not important. This is only a top cap for a water tank. I still need the part of the top cap that's going to fit in the top of the tank to be accurate, so I'm taking my time with this and getting it dead right. You may notice that I've changed the tool to a parting tool because this cuts a much squarer edge. But if you're doing a job like this, bear in mind this is only held by the nut of a 2BA bolt, so you can't put a lot of pressure on it and be more gentle than it looks with this. Once I cleaned up the outer edges, I removed the nut and used some fine sandpaper, followed by some Scotch-Brite, to get a finish like this. I need to make an ornamental knob to fit on the top of it. And this is a simple plain turning job. The hole in the centre is 2BA, which will fit on a 2BA bolt that will go through the cap. Once I parted off the component, I refitted it to a 2BA bolt held in the chuck, and by applications of different grades of sandpaper followed by polishing it on the polishing spindle, the finished part looks exactly like this. And now to complete the job, I just need to verify that this is a stainless steel bolt. Well, it's not magnetic, so I guess it is. All that's left to do now is to fit the 2BA bolt to the threaded top cap from underneath, and then fit the small knob to the top of the 2BA bolt. And that's it. When I first started this very simple ornamental turning, I didn't really know what the knob was going to look like. If I was going to make more than one, I would use a form tool. But this is an absolute one-off, and there's only one like it in the world, and here it is. I'm quite pleased with the way this water tank's turned out. It looks exactly like I thought it would look when I started making it. I'd like to demonstrate the injector now. I've taken the lid off the water tank so you can see the water level. And when I first open the water valve, the water starts to drop in the tank. When I open the steam valve, the injector picks up and water is pumped into the boiler. This Jubilee Fittings injector is excellent. It always picks up and it always pumps water into the boiler. As you can see, the water gauge is nearly full to the top, and I haven't used the hand pump, just the injector. 
But here I've overdone the injecting and as you can see the gauge glass is completely full and the pressure inside the boiler is low. I've just opened the water valve on the injector. I'm not going to inject any water into the boiler. I need to drain the top water tank into the bottom water tank which in turn is being drained into a bucket on the floor. And that concludes this special extra long episode showing exactly how to make a double water tank to allow the use of a live steam injector with a stationary steam plant. Stay safe, stay healthy, thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Main Steam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists and by doing that you can find other videos that you may like to watch and by using the playlists you can actually watch the videos back to back.